I'm Jessica Berman, Director of the Dresser Center for the Humanities, and I want to welcome you to our first Humanities Teaching Lab of the semester. Um, the Humanities Teaching Labs are part of the Inclusion Imperative, a project made possible by a very generous grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Um, Lindsay DeKerchy here, Professor Lindsay DeKerchy, who directs the labs, has been working hard to bring you several really great events this semester, so please stay tuned. Um, and I know that Marissa is coming back tomorrow to do a hands-on workshop. Um, I also want to thank um, Ali Korsran, uh, who is the Inclusion Imperative Associate, um, for all her work on putting together this event and those that will follow. Um, but now for today, I'm, I'm really pleased um, to bring you Marissa Parham, who will speak about haunted scholarship using born digital writing and experimental digital projects in the humanities classroom. And as I said, she'll also be here tomorrow for a hands-on workshop. I know some of you are signed up for that. Um, Dr. Parham is professor of English at Amherst College and directs the Immersive Reality Lab for the Humanities, an independent work group for digital and experimental humanities. The IRLH, in Immersive Reality Lab, develops and incubates digital projects for AR, VR, and screen, and generally supports the work of digital scholars. Parham also serves as one of two faculty diversity and inclusion officers at Amherst College. So you can see that her institutional work, um, as well as her scholarship, bring together the threads of digital humanities and inclusive practices in really exciting ways, and it's one of the reasons she's here today. Parham currently serves at, on the board of directors for Amherst Media and formerly served as the founding board of, on the founding board of directors for the Amherst Cinema Arts Center and on the board for the Massachusetts Foundation for the Humanities. She's also a former director of the Five College Digital Humanities Initiative, serving Amherst, Hampshire, Mount Holyoke, and Smith, and the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Um, Marissa Parham is the author of Haunting and Displacement in African American Literature and Culture, The African American Student's Guide to College, and is co-editor of Theorizing Glissons, Sites and Citations. She's also the author of numerous digital curation and essay projects, including one called Black Haunts in the Anthropocene, which is very intriguing. She also somehow finds time to do writing for more public audiences, such as uh, in venues such as the LA Review of Books and Inside Higher Ed. Her current teaching and research projects focus on texts and technologies that problematize assumptions about time, space, and bodily materiality. I'm very excited to bring you Dr. Marissa Parham. Yeah. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I'm cognizant of the time, so I'll trim around the edges a bit so that we can still exist in a timely manner. This is also the part, as in every meeting and everything else, I'll say I present and et cetera from my phone. I swear I'm not like texting and like talking to y'all at the same time, even though it might kind of look that way. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. Thank you again for the invitation. It's always nice to sort of you know, have an opportunity to speak on things that brings together sort of different parts of my life, um, working as a diversity officer in ways that actually makes real change, um, and being able to meld that with scholarship. So a lot of what I'll be talking about today, this will be a slightly more conceptual talk, but it's a conceptual talk that ties into hands-on. So that's a way of saying, what I'm giving you today is a sort of conceptual underpinning of a way of doing a certain kind of scholarship, um, and also by extension teaching, but tomorrow in the workshop, I'll also be talking about how you make the things I'm showing you today. Right, so it's almost like the show and tell of the how to make things, if that makes sense, and they kind of go together. But I think the critical underpinnings, or the sort of softly, sort of theoretical underpinnings, hopefully will be useful for you. So I want to start a bit by talking a little bit more explicitly um, about what I'll be doing today. 
And I was realizing that my last, can you all see okay? I feel like I'm in the way of the thing. You don't really have to read it that much, but um, I suggest you go look at the website, it's called Black Quantum Futurism. Um, and I realized lately that all of my talks sort of start with the same sort of opening spiel, but I can't let it go because I like it so much. And so I've been trying to use it lately almost as sort of invocation or prayer, because I think it's the space I want to be in when I begin speaking, if that makes sense. So I feel like I use this work in thinking about the black quantum futurism movement um, as a way of thinking about what kinds of critical structures might be distilled from thinking about technological adoption as adoption adaptation, sorry, as itself a kind of black cultural practice. A practice wherein, quote, the past and future are not cut off from the present, as we see here. What might it mean to articulate technological innovation as endemic to African American experience? even if so doing means resetting the timeline of how we describe or imagine the technical emergence of digital technologies. In other words, I'm very interested in putting black uses of technology, or situating black uses of technology as before the rise of the technologies themselves. We often see, for instance, if you're walking down the street, you'll see people with t-shirts, I should have grabbed one for a slide, it says black people are the future. What does it mean to operationalize this? What does it mean to take this seriously? What does it mean to actually understand that this claim on the future is mitigated, of course, by a very specific relationship to the past and makes possible a different orientation towards the future? Later on, I'll be talking a little bit about W.E. Du Bois and the notion of double consciousness. In that, I'm sort of thinking about, well, you know, so this is opening of souls of black folk, and he's talking about what it means to be African American, right? And he says this thing that, you know, black Americans are gifted with second sight because we see everything through a veil. We see not only what we see, but we also see how other people see us seeing. So we have to see ourselves and also how people perceive us constantly, right? What it means to live in that doubled land. I've always been really interested by that framing, gifted with a second sight. Right, the way it frames it in the sentence is quite sarcastic because it's not really a gift, it actually kind of sucks. Right? It's actually a condition of your oppression. But I think he's also being somewhat serious. Right? So what does it mean, again, to operationalize, instrumentalize that middle space? This thing that is a gift that is also a curse but also means you see things differently. And this also, of course, pretends to the notion of the future itself. From the perspective of my own work, my own scholarly work, Understanding the digital as both descriptive and generative of African American experiences of memory, space, and time resets the chronology for what we typically postulate as a technical device emergence of the digital. From a quantum futurist perspective, digital technologies are not just merely metaphors for black cultural production. Emergent synergies between such objects and the spatial and historical assemblages of black diasporic experience, how we put things together, how we take them back apart, are taken as occasion for what Siegfried Zielinski describes as media and archaeology. Indeed, as Michael Goddard notes, following Frederick Kettler, and archaeological approaches disrupt the linearity of technology effect dyads by making space for articulating how various media assemblages, again, what we put together and take apart, have been shown not to be implemented um, when they're first technically possible, but only when the right social, techno, sorry, social, technical um, conditions come into being to make use of them. That's to say the technology follows the use. This is important because we usually try and think of the ways in which technologies produce certain environments. This reverses that. And that reversal, I think, is really important for me. And don't worry if you don't know this word, anarchaeology. It's a made-up word. I like it, though. This is particularly useful in my work because it's helpful when trying to overcome the presumption that certain populations are simply be brought into technological spheres and instead cast inquiry towards understanding populations as participating in mutually constitutive processes with technological innovation. So I'm responding in a way to the constant stuff about like, for instance, like, you know, technology gap or digital divide. I'm like, don't tell me on the one side about the digital divide, on the other side about how like you have to like take down Vine because the black people have made it so much better and have taken it over, right? Those two narratives don't even fit together. Right, so what's at stake in that? And it's not that I don't take the notion from a structural infrastructure perspective of the digital divide seriously, but that's a problem of infrastructure, not a problem of people's engagement with actual technologies, and we have to keep those distinct and separate. By stepping away from technological medium narratives, we might therefore more easily understand, for instance, how black Twitter existed long before the rise of the platform that we currently know as Twitter. 
and thus find ways, therefore, to critique Twitter as a precipitate of those traditions. So thinking, for instance, about Twitter as a platform, as a precipitate of black oral tradition, for instance. The technology followed the social and cultural configuration. Why is this important, we might ask, for thinking about humanistic inquiry and pedagogy? And how does this intersect with matters of equity, inclusion, and justice? Like, you know, so in other words, like, why am I always talking about this? A concept like the anarchological is important because it offers us an entry point for reimagining, some would even say decolonizing, literary and cultural and social calcifications, the elements of tradition that so many people want to be able to move past. And this necessity and this feeling of wanting to move past certain kinds of calcification within disciplines, within traditions, for some it feels like, yes, we must move on. For others, it is critical to the very capacity for participation, right? So we have to also, therefore, think about the differential between populations that want to move on in the interest of moving toward new futures, discovering new things, thinking new thoughts, doing the do, right? And populations for whom that moving past is the actual condition of participation itself. That's actually a different temporality in relation to what we even think about as an academic or scholarly tradition. So in much of my own recent work, um, I describe it or talk about a speculative frameworking, the purpose of which is to distill a critical approach that takes seriously the belief that the intersection of literary and cultural studies and digital humanities produce for us a ripe space for modeling and critiquing livable futures for people invested in using hardware and software to recover, center, or thematize the lives of marginalized communities. One might think here of the Kenyan writer Kaguro Macharia, who uses thinking by Catherine McKittrick, Tavia Nyango, and Brent Edwards um, to show how, quote, the speculative becomes part of the asymptotic narration, the gap in representation, the gap in the archive, the gap in the lie, the gap that is the lie, through which and into which black life finds an origin story within life unmaking blackness. Speculation, or the speculative, might be a method that reads into and past the data-affirming archive to see what black life forms might emerge what acts of making and unmaking, what ways a human might emerge and undo the regime of man. Speculation, Macharya tells us, is also a mode of being present where one is impossible. So again, what would it mean to operationalize this? Speculation, just to repeat, is also a mode of being present where one is, in fact, impossible. Perspectives grounded in speculation, the anarchological, underwrite important, are important to thinking about inclusion, equity, and justice in pedagogy because together they help us get us what's at stake in understanding how, for instance, digital humanities as much emerges structurally, again, out of marginalized communities as the term also names a broad range of methods and approaches that may be brought to bear on various communities' cultural materials. So in the projects I'm gonna show today, um, Breakdance and Making Breakdance, which I'll say more about in a second, I'm thinking about what it means to take seriously, from the perspective of a student, the thoughts behind thoughts. So thinking about the perspective, if you're a professor or an instructor, you're thinking from the perspective of what it means to introduce material. But embedded in the notion of what it means to introduce material, there has to always, of course, be the question of reception. That's the most difficult part of all this, of course, because you have to think about how it's going to land. And not only, I would argue, do you have to think about how it's going to land, do we have to think about how it's going to land, we also have to figure out what can this thing that I've given this person be actually made into? What can they do with this, right? And so I see certain kinds of digital essay writing as opportunities to really put in people's hands the opportunity to make what they will, right, and sort of will with a capital W. It doesn't mean that we're taking away sort of, you know, a sense of a center, a sense of truth, a sense of rigor or anything else, um, but simply that we're trying to foreground in this kind of work the ways in which so much of what we think of as thinking about an object, so thinking about a book, thinking about a movie, thinking about whatever, is also an act of introspection. And how do you honor the conditions under which that introspection feels like it can honor the person who's engaging the activity? So I'm gonna switch my windows around a little bit. It's a little bit clunky. That is just the nature of things. <laughs> oh no. I have a really professional background that you don't see. So, <laughs> so oops. 
One second. See, oh, I feel so moved. <laughs> That's what you were supposed to get. Um, so I'm going to show you a few parts from Breakdance because in this piece, I'm thinking about what it means to take seriously thoughts behind thoughts, which means allowing one again to focus not just on what things mean, but what they signify to a given person. This space of which I speak is a hybrid space situated between the public, for instance, shared text or classroom, and the private. So thinking about what it means to be in this space between the public and private, between things that do and do not fit together properly, and to also as well to think about what it means, oops, I have to calibrate to the screen size, to think about as well what it means to take seriously, again, the underside of thought. Although I don't like underside of thought, it's not so much underside of thought in the sense of, mm, maybe I'll give you an example. It's not the thought that is inchoate, right? So it's not the thought you can't pull together. It's not the feeling um, that you don't quite know. So this is not a way of saying it's about a thing that people don't understand. It's about the thing that's extremely difficult nonetheless to show other people. Right? So it's precisely the underside of thought then isn't the thing the person does not understand about their own thought. It's a thing that's very specific to the experience of their own thought that they have a difficult time transmitting to someone else. Does that make sense? I want to be very clear about that. I realized I was saying the sentence. I felt it would sound like I was saying like incoherent or like secret thoughts or something. And that's cool too, but that's a little bit different than what I'm talking about here. I'm thinking about the underside of thought. The space, again, is a hybrid space, and it's situated between the public, for instance, shared text or classroom, and the private, the space wherein meaning is activated or made relevant to us as thinkers, scholars, artists, and community builders. It's the space, in other words, of why we care. At stake in the scholarly dimensionality is our ability to move between theory and practice. When working, for instance, from a marginal position, this access, again, to dimensionality is critical because it's the place of double consciousness. This notion, scholarly dimensionality, is the space between, again, what you know you're supposed to say about a text, for instance, and what you actually want to say about it, right? And again, what does it mean to actively operationalize this space? Um, so here's an excerpt from sort of the beginning of one of the projects from Small Acts that I'm talking about today. It's called Breakdance, and it's really interested in thinking about sort of, again, the questions I'm laying out here, and thinking again what it means to sort of follow meaning through all these different organic processes. So in a way, what does it mean to, um, and don't worry if it's too small to read. I don't want you to read it. I mean, I want you to read, like, please read it. But like, you can go to the website later <laughs> and read it. Don't worry about reading it now. Um, but with this project, this was an example of thinking about what it means to use text as an example of things that are, on one hand, ephemeral, but also move in an argument, move in what feels like a linear fashion, but move in moments of linearity without necessarily being beholden to it which is simply to say, not only does my argument move from left to right, it can move up and down, I can flip it over to an underside or an overside, I can amplify it out, and I can walk the reader through that movement as well. And walking the reader through that movement helps amplify for the reader the situation of the, mm, it helps amplify for the reader the conditions under which the thought came into being. So it's taking as seriously the structure and context of a thought as it is the thought itself. And there are little moments throughout, every page is different, but on this particular page, for instance, um, passages come and go, they change. So as you're looking at the page over time, it's cued to average reading time. So over time, the passages will actually start to change. Um, so also think about ephemerality, or the fact that, for instance, everyone won't necessarily see the same thing, which brings its own complexities, but I'm willing to accept it. Famous last words. Um, so in thinking about this, I was also thinking a little bit, um, sort of, and again, about, don't worry about reading it now, it's more just to sort of talk about other stuff. But thinking about when producing sorts of arts and scholarship from a marginalized position, again, the access to dimensionality is critical because for all of us, it marks the why of it all as much as it marks the when, how, and what. So I'm using this essay, which I should say was published um, in Small Acts as a born digital essay. 
um, and a special issue edited by Jessica Johnson and with addition editing by Alex Gill and Kaya McGlover. I go, I should always name our editors and all the people, but in this case it's particularly important because I took a huge chance on, you know, publishing Crazy Town. And so I'm always really grateful to them. Um, and it's also really interesting because if you think about it from the perspective again um, of pedagogy, it's really important to think about scholarly venues that are publishing digital work because that also is how we usually make the argument for producing digital infrastructures on campuses, for instance, for student portfolios, right, to be clear. So there's a way in which being able to pull these different threads together has become really important. One reason why I'm particularly excited about digital essay writing and digital scholarship is it introduces students earlier into the larger world of scholarly publishing, which always suffers from the lack of infusion of new blood. But because it puts the conditions of production in the student and professor's hands, there's a way in which you don't actually have to wait for the rest of the world to catch up with you before you move forward. Does that make sense? It on the one hand gives you a way to literally platform, right, work that you want to be able to do, the experimental kinds of work um, that students and ourselves often come up with. And at the same time, it can be done in ways that actually help scholarly publications pick that innovation up and not standardize it, but make it more possible for more people to do it without specialized software, right? And as much as possible, try to emphasize using very inexpensive or free software whenever possible for that reason. You still need a computer for some of it, although we have a few things that people can make on their phones that I'll show you tomorrow. But as much as possible, again, emphasizing people, emphasizing work that people can make with simple access they can usually get at least through their campus if they're enrolled. So this was an example of what I was talking about earlier, not this page, this is a different point that's about animation and all these other things, um, and representation and et cetera, and lemonade, it's all actually about Beyonce's lemonade, but I put fancy words around it. Um, but I was really interested with this. Um, so throughout the project, there's different options. So you can click dance, break, uh, sometimes we'll say break dance, or the center image of a tendwa. A tendwa is a Congolese, um, cosmogram. It moves in a counterclockwise motion and it symbolizes the ways in which we can use our earthly movement. So for instance, a ring stomp, a ring stomp I can show you, a ring shout later, sorry, I can show you later for instance, where dancers during American slavery for instance were moving counterclockwise and clockwise motions, reproducing essentially this notion of the inside of a clock and using it as a way as imagine themselves back to Africa, right? So it's an imagination where you move along the motion of a clock but not to return in time but actually to traverse space, right? So earlier when I was talking, for instance, about this notion of the underside, this is what I was getting at, right? When I'm saying dimensionality and underside, that's sort of what I'm talking about. Um, so throughout the essay, you can click these different elements and it takes you to different places. Um, and the amazing part is I can't remember what takes you where here. Um, that's why we cheat for talks. Um, so if we were to click one of those things, we come to this other place. And here's an example again. So in thinking about the undersides of things and framing it this way around dimensionality, I'm able to say things that maybe I don't want to necessarily have to always say too loudly, or that maybe I find too speculative. In this, I'm thinking of Edward Glissant's notion of opacity, of things that form the core of ourselves and about which we should ideally have re limited responsibility to constantly explicate or reiterate. Right, so it's the core of ourselves that we shouldn't have to explain. This is different than saying accountability. I think that's actually a different thing, right? But sometimes, and you've been, if you've ever been in a situation when you're around a lot of people who are very different from you, we know how painful it can be to have to explain something about yourself in that sort of core way, right? Because for you, it seems so basic, right? And if you have to explain it too much, it actually loses some of its power in your own personal life. Right, that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. So it could be anything that's like why you like a song or why your family goes to church and what you do. Like trying to explain, for instance, if you're African American that you're not religious but you go to church every week and they're like, what? I'm like, never mind, right? <laughs> you know, that sort of thing, right? There are a lot of things in that place for a lot of people and they come across all kinds of different constellations. Um, so in this project, in the kinds of projects I'm talking about today, it's also offering people an opportunity, again, to show rather than tell to be able to give into a community without that giving being premised on the absorption of that which makes me into a me. So I can give something to you without the presumption that you'll take everything from me in my act of giving. This plays out formally in the project on the level of language. For instance, in this case, 
parsing a really complex use of the N-word in Beyonce, sorry. And also at the same time, sort of being able to follow my discomfort with the deeply troubling undercurrents um, of Jay-Z, her husband, brings to this video the song Drunk in Love, in which he positively evokes Ike Turner's abuse of Tina Turner, for instance. So I started with one song from Lemonade called Sorry. At the end of the song, Sorry, she's having this sort of clap back or sort of like mic drop moment um, at a cheating spouse. And she says this sentence that if you know the sound was very famous, goes, you better call Becky with the good hair, right? And that moment of you better call Becky with the good hair, um, in a sort of black vernacular, picks up this notion of, yes, you found that person who will be your side piece, for lack of a better way of putting it, right? And Beck with the Good Hair also, right, goes to all those different traditions of thinking about the ways different kinds of beauties are traditionally or have been historically key to whiteness within black communities. And so the double ding is not only are you cheating on me, but you're cheating on me right with Becky with the good hair, who is this Torah figure who blah, 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 right? We can kind of extrapolate from there. But what I found striking is at the moment when I was writing this essay and sort of thinking about that line and what it meant, um, I was thinking how I was at the same time teaching Jean Toomer's Kane. And in Jean Toomer's Kane, there's actually a character named Becky, and she's known as the white woman who had two Negro sons. No one knows how she got them, right? So it's a story about a poor white woman who lives on the edge of town who every once in a while shows up and has another child who's black and no one knows who the father is. And as you can imagine, the children eventually run away and she dies under mysterious circumstances. Um, and so it becomes this really sort of complex story where on the one hand, the term Becky can resonate with me as a sort of racialized turn, term about beauty and identification and infidelity and all of these things, but it was also simultaneously resonating with me in this other way, this uncomfortable story about a woman named Becky who was also structurally someone's probably side piece, but was also through that moment experiencing immense violence in ways you can't talk about because she's also a white woman living in a world of deep segregation, right? So where's the language for talking about that Becky in relation to the other Becky? I'm not sure I even know, but I know they need to be on the same page, right? So in this example, for instance, oh, it came out a little small, but in this example, for instance, I end up putting the text of Becky in the background because I'm thinking about how it's throbbing in the background of this narrative, but I actually don't want it in the forefront even though it's there. And I name it and I talk about it a little bit, but I don't want it to rise to the forefront because I am talking about a specific thing about black women's lives, but I also can't let it go, right? So this gives me a way of signifying the thing I can't let go while at the same time understanding that there's a moment where I might also want to move on. Um, in this moment here, it's a sort of moment where it's like a triumphant sort of Grammys sort of um, performance of Beyonce and Jay-Z of this song about her being so in love. But there's a line in the song where he essentially jokes about Ike Turner um, abusing Tina Turner, right? And it's a really brutal line. It's quite shocking. The middle is essentially love song. He makes this joke about, you know, domestic abuse. But they have to dance all the way through it, right? And so thinking about, again, how we think about these uncomfortable juxtapositions of moments and time. Um, and at the same time, still enjoy the song, right? Part of what the platform gives, gives me um, a sort of space for is I have the sound turned off, but it also gives me a way of thinking about what I'm enjoying about the song at the moment where I'm also critiquing it. And I have to be able to hold those things at the same time. So a lot of this also, this dimensionality I'm talking about, is also about being able to hold more than one thought at a time, being able to hold more than one feeling at a time, because that's actually usually how we live. But the moment of discourse, the moment of writing it out for students, we're often asking them and ourselves to make a choice. And I'm not sure the choice is always fair, right? Of course, there's a space for critical thinking and logical thinking and all the things, but at the same time, there has to be a limit on that as well. So I'm going to turn now briefly to a second piece, um, a different digital piece, which is called Making, Breaking, and Dancing in the Machine. So both making, breaking, I need better words because it's hard to say them all together, but both making, breaking, and breakdance, the piece you're looking at now, are built on a theoretical paradigm that works with Edward Gleason, Antonio Benitez Rojo, Zora Neale Hurston, and Fred Moden. It also takes conceptual cues from the poet um, Imner Besa Philip, and Tazaki Shanga, and Leslie Marmel Silko. It's not really so much seeking to answer a question again, as much as it's trying to nag how to pin down a feeling. In this case, a nagging sense that I want to explore this image in Beyonce's 
excuse me, formation video, but I wasn't quite sure which language to use. So if you go back to this profoundly sort of ambivalent feeling, I had a similarly ambivalent feeling um, about another moment. Oof, maybe I do not have it up. I had a similarly ambivalent feeling about another moment um, in one of her texts, right? And so thinking about information, the sort of appearance, you all probably remember it, from formation, if you've ever seen the video before, I should have just come and played videos. Um, <laughs> but of this figure, right? So she's standing on the porch of a southern plantation manor um, house. And on the one hand, it's a figure who in the video we're seeing as a sort of immensely empowered figure. But on the other hand, it's deeply troubling because it also, I think, bespeaks this notion of, for instance, black owners of slaves. So again, how am I going to simultaneously, on the one hand, completely enjoy this image of black female power, while at the same time understanding that the imagery which that power is being served me is in fact the condition of my oppression? So, but I love the song, and how do I hold this mm -hmm. at the same time? This piece, which I won't talk too much about, is pretty exciting. So this is a movable essay. Um, so it's an essay where you can put it in any order you want and it still makes meaning, but it'll make a slightly different meaning. So thinking as well, and using this, I use it as a teaching tool in class um, to encourage students to think about writing modularly, right? So what it means to take different parts of argument and sometimes just to be able to physically rearrange it, right? So again, holding on to the sort of linearity um, of sentences, you're still making sentence things a little hidden, oops, and sometimes you drop things. Um, hmm? So I start having fun, I have to walk away. I'm in public, but, um, <laughs> but, right, but thinking as much about what it means to make arguments while at the same time making these arguments um, that don't necessarily work in ways that people explain. So in here we have hidden snippets, for instance, from Beloved, which appears throughout the project as well, and thinking here about visual symmetry. So this is a kind of argument that if you work in film and media studies, for instance, you spend pages, and it's an important skill, to spend pages and pages and pages um, sort of explaining things like visual symmetry, but it's also really nice sometimes when you can just sort of put pieces together and let them play, right, to be able to demonstrate and show it that way as well. And here, um, thinking about moments, oh, internet caught me. Um, I was trying to stay off the internet so it wouldn't get mad at me, but it caught to me. Um, <laughs> but thinking about that, and again, thinking about, again, providing ways for students to be able to show, not tell. This is also the part where I show you things like movable essays and synced videos and all the things that I'm also going to explain tomorrow and swear to you it's actually quite easy. We can all do this for ourselves as well. So the final thing that I want to be able to show you today um, and then move on to Q&A, is sort of thinking as well about one more page, which I have to actually find. Um, there are a lot of windows here. But thinking about this, and thinking as well sort of about the underside, thinking about dimensions, and thinking about the kinds of things that people don't always know to see. I've been thinking a lot, and I'm curious to know what you think as well, about what it means to produce pieces of writing that are mainly constituted by elements that people will never find. I have to say from my perspective, I've been finding it quite liberating because I like that the most difficult parts of what I have to say are somewhat buried. I feel like if someone really wants to find them, they'll be able to find them, but I kind of don't have to lead with it. Um, and that's been really interesting for me for thinking from the perspective of teaching around real complex questions. I have students do a lot of public writing, for instance, which always draws really complex questions around even the very feeling of like bodily safety in the moment of writing. So again, but at the same time, I mean, I'm sure you've had these experiences um, as teachers, you'll have that experience of the student who feels too uncomfortable to say the thing that they know in their bones must be said, but their bones must constantly feel the effects of not being able to say the thing that they want to say, even as they know it shan't be said, right? So again, those are the kinds of moments that I'm trying to navigate here. So in thinking about that, um, thinking as well about, again, what it means to situate knowledge within personal experience on the underside of the things we say, but to also invite people ways of exploring that underside as well. 
this is an essay or an element of an essay that's included in Making Breaking, where I'm talking to um, a good friend of mine, my colleague, um, Lisa Brooks, who's an indigenous scholar. And we're sitting on sort of the patio, um, it was sort of, you know, faculty dining area. Um, and it's a restaurant and hotel in our hotel in Amherst, which is named after someone who's famous for conceiving these amazing plans for the genocide of indigenous people. So we're sitting there like, huh, ain't this something? You know, every time we're sitting there, right, and we're constantly sort of reiterating this feeling in that moment, you know, as she put it, right, um, like I, from my, she's talking from my perspective. She's like, you're a stolen person sitting on my stolen land. And we're like, drinks. Right, um, but thinking about what that feeling is and what constitutes that feeling, because of course we're also incredibly happy to be there together. But that feeling can't go away. And so, what does it mean to subtend that feeling and to also attend to that feeling as well? Um, and to think about what it means. Um, so, here's also a thing for looking at making breaking. Um, if you want to figure out, for instance, if I were properly connected to the internet. Um, it'll show you where you are in case you're curious whose land you're sitting on as you're reading. It's always hard with digital stuff because you can't control, of course, where people are reading and where it's sourced from. So this will triangulate where you're sitting and where your server is sitting to let you know what's being traversed in order to deliver you um, your content. But in this piece, I wanted to pick up as well, not only the underside of things, but also thinking alongside it, um, the ways in which the unspoken is very much usually at the center of the spoken. And thinking about this as an experience of things that often by default must go unnamed, but again, I'm repeating myself intentionally, um, they must go unnamed, but at the same time are constantly welcoming excavation, right? So the key words here are dimensionality, invitation, and safety. What does it mean to create spaces into which, as a writer, a student can invite people into, while at the same time maintaining around themselves a feeling of control and safety, right? Where the digital tools we can use that encourage a certain kind of public writing, while at the same time doing it from the perspective of control. The language I give this is that to think about writing across or through dimensionality is in many ways to write from the inside of your own language, is to take your own language seriously, your own feelings seriously. At the same time, the moment of making an interface, of making the thing that's going to cohere, making the thing through which you're going to actually represent a point, um, is also a way of making a language that you pull other people into, right? So if you're thinking, this is a bad metaphor moment, but if you're thinking about the feelings in your own knowledge set as sort of, you know, the vocabulary, the platform becomes the language. And using these digital tools by freeing students from standardized platforms, you give them more opportunities to, in fact, produce their own language, their own syllabary, to produce their own alphabet, right? It could be a visual language. There's ways to do this. There are sonic languages, for instance. It can be done in Braille. There are a lot of ways to actually do this kind of work. But to center it as emerging, again, explicitly from perspective, um, and this is the part I ended up writing because I realized I had written essentially 40,000 words based on lemonade but never actually talked about the actual text ever because it wasn't about the text. It's about what the text made me think about. But I wanted to do one small experiment of what it would look like if we were to do it. Um, let me stop there. Thank you. <laughs> They tried to stop so we have time for questions. Mm -hmm. Or more showing time. Can I ask a, um, a practical question? Please. Um, how do students in your experience respond to this kind of freedom that you're offering them? Is it scary for them? Do they embrace it? <laughs> do people go back to because I'm I I'm doing a sign this semester and you can present your research results any way that you want. And then we're talking about different ways to do it. And I write a proposal about what like what it will be and why that that format right. matters and I'm just curious I've never done that before so I'm curious how students respond. Yeah. I do a lot thank you. I do a lot of scaffolding um, and a lot of very small low stakes um, no grades which is incredibly important um, to all of this for our sanity and theirs. Um, no stakes assignments. Um, and it was interesting I had this example or I had experience last semester of co-teaching a class on making electronic literature 
And my colleague was really concerned because I put every assignment I like was like, well, you could do this, you know, for 900 words for five pages, but just make one page, just make one paragraph. And they were like, mm, should we ask for more? I was like, no, watch this. Because when you give students, of course, that much freedom, it quickly spirals out of control. And so I give very, very small um, experimental assignments with very short due dates or very short windows. I can't think of the word. Time spans, right? Um, precisely because otherwise it becomes anxiety producing. Like on the one hand, you would think it would be the opposite because you know it's like it seems so brutal to be like you have three days, right, to figure out how to edit this video with words on it. But I show how to do it in class. You walk through in class the whole thing. Um, I have other students who I work with formally who work as TA, so they're available in the weird night hours that students are up and that sort of thing, right? So they can help each other. Um, and I only use software that has a lot of online tutorial, frankly. Um, but that said, I keep assignments, so the answer is I keep the assignments very small, very, very, very short, very little time between when they get the assignment and turn it in, and they do it over and over again. So for instance, at the end of the semester, they have an option of doing one final new thing, or they can go back and redo anything from the semester. And I try to scaffold it so that you're learning a new skill each time and also refining a skill. Right? And I keep it in the language of skills because there's a way in which you want to make sure they can separate. You know, I'm talking so much about the sort of organic relationship between um, what the student thinks and feels and what they're producing. I found a level of pedagogy is quite useful to separate out skill from all of that. Right? Which is all the fancy way of saying we make little things and be super ugly or super like, er, er, it doesn't work and why won't this work? I'm like, do not worry. Right? Because what you're trying to do now is scaffold. So when we first, for instance, start producing, I get really caught up in the technical, sorry, like the, like the sort of practical. Um, so usually, most of my digital class, when we first get started, I usually just come with huge piles of index cards and colored markers, frankly. Um, because you do have to get people's brains working a little bit differently. Um, and just to give them a sense, they give them a strong sense of the low stakesness, right? I'm like, I'm gonna draw a happy face. And we all compare on my face, so I'm like, mm, it does suck. Right, but like really getting in that space of critique and getting in that space of sort of sharing and trying to make it sort of as silly and basic as possible because most students, because of the world we live in, go from zero to 60 immediately. So you go from really stupid, ugly, happy faces to like their interactive narrative about their trauma, right? So that middle space has to be a very carefully managed space of a lot of safety, a lot of no stakes, and a lot of freedom. Does that make sense? That was a very long answer. Yeah. I'm also doing no stakes. Yeah, we're into it. They, they have stakes, they're good. Yeah. <laughs> How do you, like, then kind of build assessment into what you're doing with students? I don't. Um, <laughs> everyone wins. Um, it's really important, actually. I'm joking, but not joking. Okay, I'm joking, partially. Um, I think assessments usually overrated. Um, I do a lot of assessment work. So I have a lot of thoughts on this. I can go for hours from like institutional assessment versus programmatic. I mean, on and on. I'm an outside reviewer. Right? All I do is assess. Right. That's why I believe it's overrated. Um, but feedback is useful, and so the way I do it in the class in these classes is that I. Um, don't grade assignments, so I don't grade student work, but the students are required to evaluate each other's work, and I grade the evaluations. And that gives me an opportunity to build that, because the purpose of grading ultimately is to assess and also to instill values, for better or for worse, like let's all be transparent. We try to pretend otherwise, but it's just not. You're also sharing values. And I actually don't think it's a bad thing if you can state them outright, so I feel very strongly about grading these with a rubric for instance, um, and so they don't get grades, again, so they don't get grades for their individual work, but they're graded on how they assess each other. And we have class conversations about what that rubric should look like, about clarity, kindness, generosity, help, um, close reading, distant reading, you know, we do a whole thing about what the rubric should be for each assignment. Um, and then that's what they use, not that rubric, but they go into it knowing that's what they'll be assessed on, and so they have to practice. And it's actually really hard 
um, to give people really good assessment, um, kindly, for instance, mm -hmm. right? So like, it's hard, like you get dinged as hard for being like, this sucks, no one really does that at this point, but you get dinged as hard for this sucks as you would be dinged for just saying like, this was so great, mm -hmm. right? And, like, that's kind of the same comment, actually. <laughs> you know, that's how we talk about it in class, because you want to kind of distance them from the idea, which is correct, that um, correct based on the entire school life, which is that moment of assessment isn't an assessment of thing in front of them, in front of you, it's actually a referendum on their presence there. Mm -hmm. um, so anything that divides or shh, that's a part a little bit. Does that make sense? Is that... So yeah, and what's interesting that if you're thinking about like, you know, a class and sort of how your sort of class grade should look, participation, um, the assessment assignment, um, yeah, participation, assessment, assignment, and like, you know, sort of the blogging sort of work they do. I get the exact same sort of curve I get if I were like rigorously grading each assignment, and that's been really interesting to me as well. The grades kind of fall out the same way, actually. So no one even notices I don't grade anything. <laughs> Yay, recording. Mm -hmm. um, I have, do you, so when the students, are in one of your classes, they present them, or do they just watch them privately? Usually privately. So there's no, okay, we're gonna show our things today? We do show and tell every class. Okay. And we usually have probably about 40. I teach very long classes. Right. Um, so the students can sign up. I mean, if I have college <coughs> systems, so we have different systems of credit. So it could be a class or class and a half. It's essentially a class of lab, but we do it continuously. So it's like a three and a half hour for us. So we have a lot of time. Right, right. Um, and so we tend to, but it's fun time, because like, you know, it's like 45 minutes, like we're playing card games, you know? <laughs> we're drawing happy faces. Um, we're doing show and tell, so we do a lot of show and tell. And we do show and tell with the expectation. I tend to bring things that I can't figure out for myself to start us out, um, and then they work up too. Because the trick, you can always get the person who wants to show off a thing they figured out, but the trick is to get the person to do show and tell with something's, because something's broken. Right, but usually within a few weeks we get there. I think the purpose of show and tell is to either show people something cool because you work so hard, because you can end up working like you know an hour to get this video to line up properly, or two hours, right? right. Um, but it's also just to say, I can't figure this out, I just need help. Um, but the actual assessment and the sort of engagement of projects, one, because they often tend to be quite personal, um, they do on their own, but everyone can see everyone's projects. You can opt out, but we have a big drop box, frankly, where everyone's project and every draft and every permutation is, and then they get assigned because we do sort of like triads where we do control who assesses whom, just because students have such differential skills. And so every once in a while you'll get a student who has a really amazing, ambitious project but no programming experience, and a programming student who just kind of is gonna like play with some tools but isn't gonna do anything very fancy but wants to help that other student. Right, so you can also get credit, for instance, for helping each other. You can opt out of a project and become a team member of someone else's project. If they, someone comes up with a project they really want to move forward with. And we have all kinds of resources signifying and talking about that as well. Can I follow up? So mm -hmm. I'm a theater teacher. We do all sorts of odd, <coughs> making tiny little original pieces. Mm -hmm. So do your students oh. ever, on, with all this layering, yeah. is, there ever, is there ever a live component what way? So this is happening, right? Mm -hmm. The thing that you're just describing to us is happening. And I can either walk around the, I can, I mean, okay, so it's happening. Mm -hmm. And there, and then you, the performer, the lecturer, are, you're doing something in relation to that also. Mm -hmm. Yes. That is, that is part of the thing that isn't, that could be improvised, but I mean, so you are, Beyonce, also. No. <laughs> <laughs> or some other way of, some other um, text or something that you want to deliver in a live way. I'm not sure I get your question. I mean, I'm definitely there. I'm like too basic to answer the question. I'm like, I'm definitely in the classroom and there's definitely a lot of improvisation, a lot of making. I might have gone too technical on your question as you were talking. Um, because we work a lot with different haptic um, and sensory technologies as well. 
So a lot of sort of how do you make things live in the moment? So how do you make music and how do you capture ephemeral information? And how do you capture ephemeral experience to reproduce into a thing that can't be reproduced? Right. Um, so I kind of went that way with your question, but I'm worried you're asking something different. No, I'm just saying that you were saying there's all of, there's the, all of these layers of thought and feeling, mm -hmm. and you're trying to compress them into one space in a way, right? And Got express it. each of the layers in a slightly different way, or you could. Right. And the whole composite is like a crystal ball or something that we can sort of read through all of these things that you, the maker, have ever thought felt about the thing. I see what and you're saying. And then is there a live component where there's yet another you, mm -hmm. pla another plane of capture, of thought? Or it could be an object, right? It could be I brought in a TV that's doing something else, right? Right. That's also a thought that I'm capturing. That's all. I, it's, it's too falutin. I don't know what I'm talking about. No, no, I'm no. I'm really, I get immediately sucked in. Making them have... A, making my students understand that there's constantly more than one thing going on absolutely and that that's okay I got and they're now. responsible for it and they can express it in all these different modalities mm -hmm. right? no i think that's perfect and again i'm like overthinking because like literally as you're talking trying to make a thing i'm like yes and then we'll have a camera and look at thing. like literally like i'm sort of doing right. it i was thinking i can't remember which project it is right now um but one of the projects and actually part of, oops, um, break dance. I showed you all, for instance, the sort of movable essay part. There's another short part where, um, I know where it is, there's actually another short part where people, it's not working now, I'm not properly connected to the internet, but um, it's the same sort of movable essay. This is a very low grade version of what you're saying, but the ways of trying to come for that kind of experience. So you can arrange the essay as you like. Um, and these are all snippets you would have seen throughout Breakdance. These are all quotes from earlier in the project. And then there's this final box here that people can type into. Um, so you can click, and it submits a little form. And then people submit. So this is something someone actually submitted when Morrison died, for instance. And so it has a live box. At first I had it completely live. So someone could click it and type on their own phone or own device, it appears in the essay and it becomes part of the record of this. But I was like, I think the internet's are a little too crazy for that right now. Okay. So I changed it so it's a stopgap, so it comes to me first and then it goes. Yeah. I'm on the fence about that. Right. Actually, I would accept feedback on that. I just kind of went deer in the headlights a little bit when I realized the full implications of what that was going to mean. Um, but yeah, so different ways. And then as you combine it in different ways, it sort of produces a background algorithm that makes it, this is the ring shot I was talking about earlier, um, that transforms it into an arrangement that becomes video and has audio and et cetera. But my point simply is there are ways in which many, I can think of many ways in which you can actually integrate live performance into this. Not only live performance in the moment of being, for instance, in the classroom, but also live performance um, so that remote users would also be able. We have another project called the Afro Future Femme Project um, that asks people, to engage a serious questions about um, the identifies Afrofem, um, thinking about sexuality, and it uses different snippets it collects from people of audio. Some weeks it asks you to write and it does live writing. Other weeks it asks you to do video, so you do like a video talking to the camera. Others it is audio, and then I'm working with the artist, um, Sheila Lawson, who remixes all those parts of people into new live performances. So she takes the stuff live. Um, to remake into new things. So that might be an example, too, of what you're talking about. And it's the kind of thing we actually prototype with students. And also, to go to the last question, sorry, I'm going on and on. Also, but the other reason why we don't do it all live, or on the show and tell, the reason why you get so much time on their own to assess projects is one, for privacy, and two, these are larger, these are usually 50 to 100 person classes. Oh, got it. I should be clear. I'm talking as if it's like a time of 10 person class. Right. It's 50 okay. or 100 people. So there's a pure time constraint on it. Yeah. I should have led with that. Because yeah. <laughs> it was actually a management decision on the front end that became like pedagogically useful. Right. Right. Got it. Thank you. Could, could you talk a little bit about uh, intellectual property mm -hmm. issues? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's lots. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
we tend to, with student pro projects, we don't worry that much about it, to be honest. I just don't think it's appropriate, um, which I know is a crazy thing to say. But I think for most kinds of making, there's usually a sort of loophole that's relevant. So if a student wants to, so for thesis projects, we think about it. So for projects that are going to be entered to a public record and stay online and live, of course, we think about it. Um, but for the most part, for student making, we tell them not to worry about it. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it, but not to think about on the front end because it destroys their capacity for making, right? For a project like this, I have a gazillion slides of hands, thank you, recording, um, around fair use. Um, so for instance, there'll be moments, for instance, where I might be using an image by an artist um, I make sure they're carefully cited. You can click through, visit the IRS. So you can actually click any image um, as an independent artist and it'll go to their work. Um, and also I make sure I only use images I'm actually talking about, right? So for instance, this is fair use, even this, because I'm actually discussing this throughout the essay, these actual clips and snippets. Do you see what I mean? But if I were using them only decoratively, then I couldn't use them legally, right? And there'll be other moments, for instance, there was a moment I was joking with someone because when I first made breakdance in certain ways it was so much more beautiful, but there are things I had to do to make sure, um, like this scene, there were things I had to do to make sure I would be okay on the level of fair use because of course there's limits on digital work around the level of um, high fidelity, right? So I had to degrade the images, right? So there are these moments, for instance, where I would have these sort of what I thought were really interesting and very beautiful, so in this one, this is a Beyonce image, um, where she's sort of wearing, oops, I might have actually missed it, I think I skipped it. I gave you the wrong one. But anyway, it was a sort of image in a sort of moment um, where she's sort of wearing this beautiful yellow dress and it's kind of like stepping down and doing a whole thing. And I realized I had to go back and actually change it because um, of fair use, because I had produced too much, an image with too much fidelity, right? Um, does that make sense? Again, probably an over-technical answer. But By fidelity, you mean the resolution was The resolution. High? Okay. So I had to lower the resolution on the image. I think my computer is just working out actually from the screen. It's showing on here, but not over there. But, um, so this for instance was originally in beautiful full HD, and I was like, yeah, no. <laughs> and I was like, we're going to make it art, right? So we made it. <laughs> um, and so I pulled down the resolution and said, made a semi transparent thing. There's other places throughout where um, I use bits of images and I have to be sure um, to overlay or to transform the image in some way so that I'm not actually breaking fair use. And what would break fair use, I think, in that moment usually um, is if someone could substitute looking at your project for actually engaging with the original text. Or grab it, right? Exactly, yeah. right. And this is also set up in a weird kind of programming. I usually like very clean programming, but it's actually weirdly some obfuscated programming structure precisely because it makes it hard to pull stuff out of it. Sorry, again, very long answer, but it matters. Mm -hmm. In the mid. Hi, um, I find your work to be very fascinating, so like, thank you for coming. Um, <laughs> But my question is, uh, I guess, because your work relies so much on the audiovisual, um, and I know you've mentioned that you kind of want to center your work on being honorable to the piece itself and as well as the audience and how they experience it. Um, in an audiovisual way, how do you toe the line between being honorable without being performative? And if I could ask another question, in what ways have you seen or have you maybe engaged in performative behaviors when having to discuss these topics or engaging in performative media? Yeah. Can you say more about what you mean by performative? Um, I guess like in the sense that it's kind of grandstanding or silencing other voices mm -hmm. for the sake of, I guess, um, making yourself look good or mm -hmm. making your own voice more powerful than well, in this case, I see what you're saying. Yeah, grandstanding, eh. I would say that in this case, I would have a complex answer to that because the underlying premise is I am trying to write a thing out of my own experience. And I think it's a worthwhile practice for writers, particularly writers from particular backgrounds, to become comfortable being forthright with their own perspective. I'm not sure it's grandstanding. Um, I do think that one has to be careful. And it's also difficult because the question you're asking, I'm trying not to answer it the wrong way because 
what I hear underlying your question also are the sort of very long standing debates, even between artists and critics. And so, what is the role of the critic versus the role of the artist, right? Um, which is always really difficult. I mean, the place where I catch flack is um, people who love a text or love Lemonade are like, why are you being critical at all? And then critics are like, you're not being critical enough because they're showing me how beautiful this is, right? Um, and that becomes like the tension in a way. Um, so what I try to focus on as much as possible, I mean, my background technically is in literary theory, full disclosure. Um, and so what I'm ultimately always focused on are the ways in which I can use an explication of my own experience to make a larger point. Right, because the purpose of theory is to take specific examples and to amplify them into more generalizable um, meaning. And that's just the kind of work I try to engage in. I'm not sure what else I can do beyond that because for me personally, um, I'm over-personalized, but I know personally, um, if I spend too much time being worried that I'm taking up too much space, I've just, you know, damned myself to no space at all. Because I have to fight for the little bit of space that I have. Am I answering the right question? Yeah, no. no. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Oh, in the back. Oh. Thank you. Um, I'm actually a graduate student at UMBC in the Text Technologies and Literature program. I just took an Afrofuturism class last semester, um, and we read um, one of the readings was Christina Sharp's mm -hmm. um, In the Wake mm -hmm. on Blackness and Being. And I feel like this platform would be perfect in like engaging with that because it is kind of um, the, the the way that the book is written, things are kind of chunked in different mm -hmm. ways so that it's breaking temporality with the black experience. Mm -hmm. So I was curious if there's actually like an archive of um, like scholars using this type of digital humanities or this type of this tool um, that I could, I, I don't know if there's an archive that I can reference to just kind of see what's out there and maybe have inspiration on like how I can and I can contribute to that yeah. type of literature? I don't know about that. I haven't seen very much okay. um, in terms of digital work, but we think if like the edge a good place to start actually would be with Small Axe Archipelagos, which is the publication um, in which I published this because they've published other digital texts. Okay. Um, and they often tend to publish digital texts that reference um, each other. I think in terms of our archive of this kind of work, I don't think that's much, there's going to be that much there because it's a relatively new way of right. working. Yeah. Um, but there's also a long history, um, oh, I'm blanking on the person's name. It's a person at Brown. Um, I'm going to go insane. I'll think of it as soon as the Q&A is over. I'll think of it all day and all night. <laughs> I'll see the name every day for the next, um, but it'll come to me in a second. I'm blanking, I'm sorry. Um, because there's multiple histories. There's the histories of people who are now working what we think of as sort of black studies, um, sort of discourse, but there are also long histories of people who were particularly sound and video artists who weren't necessarily included in black studies traditions historically, um, who've been working for a really long time. Um, and I think they also have some really exciting work mainly around sort of um, using digital projects that are videos. So essentially, it would be like a music video that's all text, for instance, as part of that tradition. And there are a few artists working that way as well. But in terms of sort of multi-layered stuff, I'm not sure there's many projects right now that are doing it. But hopefully they will be very soon. Um, I'm sorry, I have a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. The original image you showed us with the, um, I think it was the Black quantum, what was that? Futurism, yeah. I went too quickly. Um, let me find it for you so you can catch it. So it's nice. It's a collective working out of Philadelphia. Um, I really made this little black um, quantumfuturism.com. It's a collective working out of futurism. And they work on a variety um, of sort of projects and different kinds of community interventions. I'll just go now. Um, they're really interesting. I really love them because they're working sort of at the intersection between sort of the artistic and the theoretical. But they're also really good at this thing that I'm obsessed with, which I keep calling operationalizing. So it's like, okay, we have this insight. 
So what does it mean to make this into like a youth media program? Or what does it mean to make this into a thing? And they just do really amazing work. And I just always throw their slide up whenever possible because I want people to support them. I think it's really important to also remember the fact that I should have said this, um, that of course people are doing this adjacent to academia, outside of academia, because one reason we like digital tools, it gets very Pollyanna, but it's very important to realize that it's not something to which you need specialized access. Um, environmental access, which is say you don't need to be enrolled <laughs> to be able to do it. Thank you. Thank you again for your talk. Um, I'm thinking a lot about, um, you mentioned earlier kind of like, uh, like when you were talking about Lemonade and how you know, as you want to critique it, there's so much you, you find pleasurable about it, so much that you enjoy about it, and I feel like that's a really interesting paradigm happening with black popular culture right now, so many different yeah. facets of like, you know, I love this, but I know it's problematic, but I, I, I don't know how to, I don't want to talk about this in public, or right. you know, because I know I shouldn't be looking at this and doing this mm -hmm. or whatever. But I'm kind of curious. On one end, um, if the conversations you've had with your students about things that have come into the classroom that that have that dimensionality to it, and you know, yeah. what's happened, and then also in your in your work, have you tackled any other um, case studies or incidents where you've kind of had to grapple with that same kind of duality and then how to packing that for um, uh, for for both um, people experiencing your work and then also kind of how it, it's unfolding or how some of those conversations are unfolding in the classroom. Yeah. Um, and just to kind of give you a sense of what I'm thinking, like when I think of folks like Megan Thee Stallion or, you know, things where it's like, oh, I love what you're doing, mm -hmm. but then I, I think about like the legacy of black women and bestiality and how that's kind of coupled in your name and then all of the, you know, all these different kinds of implications mm -hmm. that are really underneath the surface and like really important conversations that we should be having that at the same time I want to enjoy the, you know, I just want to enjoy the content or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of curious like how your students have talked about that and processed that in the classroom and, and, and everything, like, if, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. It's pretty, it's nonstop. Um, and I teach like very standardized sort of lit theory courses, like I teach a course on Tumor, Faulkner, and Morrison, but I also teach courses on popular culture. Um, and I'm really interested in how we carry the sort of critical affordances, so the sort of habits of mind across those discourses, right, and across those situations. Um, this most comes to a head in thinking about black popular culture, and also a class I teach for instance on girl power or even the word itself is like, I don't even think I can get to like the word, but yet I do, but yet I do. Oh, I know better, but mm, here we are, right? And like really think about what it means to have to occupy that space, right? All the other kinds of differences within that space, right? Um, which is simply to say, what's that moment when I love a girl power course, but that girl power is like so specifically hyper hetero, am I re You know, I mean, it goes around and around and around, right? Um, and so what I try to emphasize as much as possible with students with myself is that I can be both people at the same time. I can know exactly what's wrong. I know everything's wrong with everything in every moment in myself, you know? Like, but there's a way in which that's not, now I'm going to crumble under my own self-analysis. <laughs> but, you know, there's a way in which that's not a sustainable way to live. And it's also not a sustainable way to actually transform society. Um, I think as much as possible, it's really important to be able to locate sites of pleasure to figure out even what one would want to salvage in any transformation, to figure out what is the thing. I think what's so difficult, so I should, full disclosure, part of this is I spent a lot of my younger life as um, a rap and radio DJ. And yeah, I mean, here I am on one hand, like feminism, on the other hand, like, you know, spinning rap records. It's hard, right? Um, and it was difficult because even a lot of what was most terrible about those sort of hip hop moments, it's difficult, bless you, because on the one hand, on its sort of surface, it's all messed up. But in this delivery, it's also encoding a kind of knowledge or a way of talking that shows that this thing that's being said that's so screwed up is actually mainly metaphorical. But I'm not gonna go back and think about like, women's violence through like a metaphorical perspective. It still has a precipitate, right? It still has an effect, it still has an impact. Even though I understand at the moment of delivery, it's actually doing a thing, 
right? They're literally figures of speech. They're literally terms of phrase that carry cultural weight even beyond the thing that's actually being said, right? Um, I mean, the way I like, you know, figured out I had like a more sort of like hang at the club way of saying, but I had found a way of just simply saying, I love it. I just wish this dude had like a better imagination, but at least he can say it well. Like I found ways to kind of say, so I've actually found ways to work critique even like the most head bopping kind of moment. I was like, with this dude's flow and his vocabulary, if he just really has something to actually talk about, he could change the world. Like, I can imagine saying that in a non-corny way. I'm on teacher mode, so it came out corny, but I swear to God, I can pull it off. But it's work, right? And thinking about sort of what it means, again, to sort of meet people where they are, but also not let them off the hook. I think that's been a really striking thing. I was thinking of working on a project, I've already given it up, of thinking about sort of like, you know, aging rap artists. Right, I mean, it was a whole thing that's deeply complex, and I do not want to open this can of worms intentionally right now. But you know, if you're like, you know, sort of were able to transact on very specific, for instance, misogynist tropes, and we know the ways of pop culture lately, it changes. For instance, like once you have a daughter, right? And there's a way in which I think there's actually a really important story about growth to tell there, but it's hard to tell that story because both ends of the spectrum are just so kind of. Ugh. If I can summarize my feelings, <laughs> Ugh. right? But a lot of this project, I think, was very much, the Lemonade project was very much caught up in that. Um, and I do want to say also that um, I think Lemonade is actually different from other pop culture objects. I think it's different. Um, it, is and it isn't a pop culture object, to be honest. Um, so I also try to be careful with certain audiences of, not you all at all, but um, we're not this question at all, to be clear. But with some audiences, we're more like, why are you even talking to me about this Beyonce? You know, or is it her name Beyonce? You know, like literally, people are like, who are you even talking about? In those moments, I go the opposite way, very intentionally, um, of pointing out that I think it's actually a very important cultural milestone. Right? It's actually not like everything else. Um, and I think it will stand the test of time, and it actually bears rigorous critique. Um, but the reason why I'll stay on the test of time and why, and that's usually the test for why something's pop culture versus, you know, culture or art, right? Is simply because if you're looking at the Lemonade visual album specific, sorry, speaking specifically the Lemonade visual album, um, they send it sort of music video hour in five minutes or whatever. Um, it's made with so many artists. Like I think something like every two or three minutes is a different well-known visual or word text artist. It's actually pretty astonishing. It's like 30 different artists embedded in that city, in that video, and that's astonishing. It's like a monumental act of like you know collaborative creation, right? So I think that's what actually matters about. And I say that like the reason why the structure of break dance is a sort of paratactic, so like different pieces stitched together, is because I'm reading Lemony as a thing that was stitched together, and because it was so stitched together, it enabled me to feel something about the way I'm stitched together. You see what I mean? And that's how I was able to make an argument out of it. I'm starting from your question, but that's just an example of a way of thinking about what texts have to offer us and that we actually need a critical lens to be able to get there because, and this is the you know, terrible grandstanding thing about critics versus artists, on some level I might be making a claim that exceeds even the album's claim about itself. But that's the, you know, my job. <laughs> <laughs> Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. That was a rough question, thank you. I didn't mean to. No, it's a good way. No, it's not a I just feel like a intense. Because I feel it very deeply. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask you a quick, maybe a last question. I don't know if there are other questions. That, um, so I want to um, think a little bit about the public dimension of what you do. And um, I have one qu question about the students and one about your own work. And the first is a kind of sort of simple question about um, you talked about the student work all ending up in a big drop box, mm -hmm. which is obviously password protected. Is there a point at which this work becomes public or is meant to be public? Or you know, wh what do you think about in terms of um, student voice and being public? Yeah. And then the other is about your, um, your own sort of more um, public venue writing, like Billy Reed's books, which is quasi-academic or you know, other, other places like that, and um, uh, I imagine that, that requires a very different valence than writing for small acts. So, you know, how do you think about the importance for academics of doing both this really layered and, com and um, technologically complex and also, you know, very intricate mm -hmm. kind of writing, and then also writing for other venues? Yeah. 
So with student work, the first thing I'll say is that it's mainly private. I give them lots of options for going public and for developing public projects using public platforms like Itch.io and other game sharing, for instance. Platforms, we do hosting, part of my independent lab. I have a good chunk of former students who wanted to do the 2.0 of their projects. Um, so these are students who have graduated, who did great projects, who want to make them even better. So we pulled them into the lab and we developed their projects for a year or two after graduation, for instance. So we have lots of venue um, or different ways to think about that. I do a lot of sort of showing students sort of how to manage their digital identity, how to put stuff using free repositories online, how to share it, how to get into different communities. Like, you know, are you more of a Tumblr type? Or are you more of a Twitter type? Like, where you should share your stuff? And we have a lot of conversations about that. Um, in terms of writing and sort of speaking across registers, um, it's just been my shtick for a long time that I'm always the same person. I wear the same clothes, I talk the same way. Um, not kidding. I would, if we were going bowling now, this is my outfit. <laughs> if I had a meeting now, this is my outfit. I look the same all the time. Um, LOL. Um, and also that, which can be hilarious sometimes. Um, and it goes for speaking as well, um, or writing. I've worked really hard to work out a voice that to me feels like the middle place because I am trying to do like a very specific German hermeneutical theory um, sort of thing that you know they can't even read themselves. That's why it's a little amazing. Um, but really finding a sort of middle place that assumes that any reader can always get to where you are, but you have to also work to not be obscure. Um, anyone can read complex work. It'll take them more time, for instance, right? Um, and then when I teach writing to my students, I've realized lately the kinds of skills I'm sure we all teach and we all use that you learn over time. Um, like I'm still going to use my words like hermeneutics or paratactic, but I'm just going to use it with a comma, right? So always making sure you're making the work, you're doing the work of definition at the moment of speaking. Because there are always going to be very specific jargony terms that people need to know in a certain context because they're actually useful, right? Um, so hermeneutics is when you do a very close reading of like a sentence or of a text or of a picture of this picture, for instance and you really promote every element, element of it all together as carefully as possible to come to a sense of meaning, right? And so you get into this habit of like sort of adding a comma, saying what you mean, one sentence, move on. And if someone, but also delivering it hopefully in a way that someone has a question to just ask you. Because I think it's really, I don't think you were saying this, but I think it's really deadly to imagine um, that somehow you're going to be speaking on different registers to different audiences because it's not to me to decide who people are and what they know and what they can handle. And there's something so inherently dangerous in me trying to scale up and scale down um, that I sort of refuse. And I also feel very deeply that if I'm from an audience and someone's like, who is this Beyonce of who you speak? I'm like, oh dear soul, let me help you. But equally, if someone's like, I don't get what you're saying about hermeneutics, it's the same, oh dear soul, let me help. It's the same. Because as far as I'm concerned, that's the same gap in knowledge. It's about different knowledges, right? And so again, trying to find a space that makes it possible um, to welcome people, and it also something that makes no sense, like someone just hopefully will call me on it, um, and then I'll say, mm, I'll stand by that, and then we'll have a good fight, and it'll be cool, and we'll all learn. That was a bad ending. <laughs> There's another double consciousness, which I just really loved, uh, which is the, the affect of theory. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking of, in my class, we talked about uh, feminist Ryan Gosling meme, oh, um, yeah. and that's where we started, and then we <laughs> read Boys, and we talked about that double Beautiful. consciousness, <laughs> which is what I got from this as well. I mean, you're, a lot of what you were talking about, I thought you were going to cry. I, it, it made me almost, there was a lot of mm, poignant affect mm -hmm. attached to theory reading. Um, which is really a beautiful way of thinking about what you're doing in terms of code switching because on the one hand you're dealing with the digital which is very literal on the other hand you're dealing with these very high theoretical mm -hmm. concepts so it doesn't really have there's no question mark here <laughs> except maybe there could be a, an emoji or something or an emoji uh, and um, but I mean did I get the wrong thing, or is that there too? No, I think it's absolutely, it's very there, and it's really hard. I have a hard time reading and a hard time because like, I get back into it, and I start revising, I start thinking, I have to say one more thing. Um, I actually try it for these kinds of talks, and hopefully it's not too much, but you know, I write as little as possible, because I know if I get too into it, I can't get back out of it. 
right? So I just try manually, just one page, you know, or two pages. So I'm just trying to sort of stay in a place where I can sort of stay between registers because my inclination, by virtue of my training and just my proclivities um, as a human, who I am, um, I'm gonna deep dive, right? But then you all be like, what's she been talking about? I'm like, shh, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, like, that's not appropriate. <laughs> and so I try to, again, find that space where both things are gonna be possible, but it's a lot. I mean, in break dance, I was, you know, joking, do all this work, and at some point, like, you know, the biggest moment of close ring, I thought, or the hardest part to write was this thing about the N-word. Because, you know, I'm usually, again, doing a thing about showing, not telling, and that's a moment I kind of have to tell a little bit, but not too much, right? Because it's not about the word per se, it's about the delivery of the word, and how the delivery of the word is actually a specifically African-American cultural function that has a sort of sonic whisper behind it you have to know how to hear. And I want people to be able to find the whisper, so I have to name it, then I feel like a betrayer. Come on, here I am telling like, you know, secrets of the blacks or something, right? Um, and it feels really like too much. Uh, so I actually pulled that page to be much longer, actually. I pulled a lot out. I was like, no, I'm going to say these things. And if someone who knows what this is, they can pull it together. Someone who doesn't know what it is has a strong sense there's something here. And everyone else will just be left behind, and that's okay, too. Yeah. Hopefully happily left behind. I, I just wanted to say thank you for your um, for sharing with us. Uh, I kind of wish that you were a professor here at UPC <laughs> so I could take your class. Because um, I do appreciate, you know, pedagogical uh, approaches where it's almost like a, a professional development for us students and for the professor. And it's like, like a reciprocal relationship. Um, hopefully one day I'll bring that to my students that you've brought so succinctly. Um, but I appreciate that uh, within this work that you can um, exist within multiple times and places and still express a, a wide variety of layers. Um, as a student, we're, we're taught that you need to take a stance and, right. and stick to that and your entire you know, thesis and everything has to um, support that. Argument. Exactly. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and, and that's just... To, to be able to exist in multiple places and still be uh, right, or even wrong, if someone thinks right. that you're wrong, right. too. Yeah, <laughs> you can still be wrong. But that you yeah. can still have that expression, is that's, that's really exciting to me, so thank yeah. you. Thank you, and I think the thesis statement and the argument thing, like when I'm teaching writing, especially big classes, I teach writing assignments and skills, and it's incredibly important, but it's a tool. Right. Right, it's supposed to be one tool in your repertoire. Um, and there's a way in which, we have to be really careful not to let students sort of imagine that it's the only tool, especially if they're not going to particularly master it. Because some people won't, some people won't, like all tools. Right. Right? And so there's a way in which if you reify a single tool, you're also reifying a single approach, which means you're actually cutting all these people out. It doesn't mean that the people, like, if you're imagining, like, I hate using grades this way, but the person's got A plus with the tool, that's great. A with the tool, that's great. But if you're a B, B minus with the tool, you're actually okay, too, because you might be an A with something else. Mm -hmm. Right? So making sure there's always that range. And, yeah, the professional development thing, thank you for noticing that. I just believe students are only students for like 15 minutes of their lives. So let's treat everyone that way. Right. It's that moment where you have a student, you're like, oh, I teach mainly undergrads. Um, and you look up and you're like, in three years, you're gonna be like a principal <laughs> after graduating. In three years, you're gonna be my damn doctor. You know, you know what I'm saying? So like, eh, student, right? right. Um, <laughs> whatever. But you have a responsibility, of course, to teach all Right. How can you use the tools that, you know, like break, no, you have to know the rules in order to break them. Exactly. Right. Making sure they know them, but also don't think that somehow those tools define them, I guess. Well, on that note, I think, well, thank you very much. For <laughs>